All right. Good evening, everyone, and welcome again to the Theodore Roosevelt inaugural site's fourth Tuesday speaker night. My name is Lenora Henson. I'm the deputy director curator at the TR site, and I'm joined behind the scenes by the TR site's programming assistant, Trisha Zarpa. <laughs> Uh, the Speaker Night series actually got underway uh, back in 2015, and we're especially excited as we continue to celebrate the TR site's 50th anniversary this year. As you may know, uh, the TR site is Western New York's only National Park Service site, although we are managed on a daily basis by a local foundation. And uh, that foundation is also responsible for raising nearly $500,000 each year to keep our doors open. In that vein, I wanna say a special thank you to all the TR site members who are with us today. Your support is always appreciated, but even more so these days as we continue, even two years later, mm -hmm. continue to adapt to ever-changing circumstances. If you're not yet a member, uh, I'm going to drop a link into the chat and you can follow that to learn more about TR site membership. I would be remiss, however, if I didn't also acknowledge and appreciate the generous financial support of our series sponsors, New York State Council on the Arts, as well as our numerous annual sponsors. We couldn't bring you this sort of programming without them. The Theodore Roosevelt Inaugural Sites Monthly Speaker Night Series is our, is our opportunity on the fourth Tuesday of most months to invite experts to help us think about some of the issues that were important during TR's presidency and continue to be relevant today. In case you're new to our Speaker Night Series, I should also mention that NISCA's support has enabled us to record nearly all of our speakers for the past four years. So if you've missed any of them, I would encourage you to check them out, check out the recordings on our YouTube channel. I will drop that link into the chat as well. So be sure to check those out. I should also mention um, for our online audience, uh, if you know anybody's having questions, feel free to, you know, again, if any of the tech isn't quite working the way it's supposed to be, I'm assuming since I haven't gotten any messages, everyone can hear me and we're good, but feel free to chat um, if there are any questions. With that said, I'm delighted to introduce this evening's speakers. Tara, this evening's speaker. Tara Kathleen Kelly is an independent scholar who earned a PhD in American history from John Hopkins University. She's taught history for 20 years, first to middle schoolers and later at the college level. Her 2018 book, The Hunter Elite, Manly Sport, Hunting Narratives in American Conservation, 1880 to 1925, explores the role sport hunters played in the progressive conservation movement. Theodore Roosevelt, of course, in some ways epitomized this idea of the hunter elite, and Dr. Kelly's work helps us to understand how an exclusive group of wealthy recreational hunters, like TR, managed to achieve widespread public support for their particular brand of class-based conservation. I'm gonna turn things over to Dr. Kelly momentarily, but would like to remind and encourage our audience to use the Q&A function to submit questions um, at any point in the talk. I will facilitate our Q&A after Dr. Kelly finishes her remarks. So with that, Dr. Kelly, thank you for being here and sharing your expertise with us. I am going to turn things over to you. All right, thank you very much, Lenora. Um, I'd like to start by thanking you and the TR inaugural site and its wonderful sponsors for hosting this and for inviting me to it. And I also wanna thank all the audience members who've tuned in for the talk. Um, I'm going to be, I, I tend to put a lot of quotes into my talks. I always enjoy hearing what people at the time said, and I'm not going to be making um, air quotes at you because it'll look like you're being attacked by a lobster. So I'm going to be trying to indicate that by using my voice. Let's hope that works out. All right, so making the case for conservation, Roosevelt, the media, and the battle for public support. I don't know how well you can see the caption of this, Mr. Phillips regrets the impending extinction of the grizzly bear. This wonderful picture is from William Hornaday's 1906 book, Campfires in the Canadian Rockies. And to modern audiences, this caption seems so contradictory, it's a bit funny, but it was meant very seriously at the time. Phillips, who was Pennsylvania State Game Commissioner, was actually an ardent conservationist. He just, like many Americans at the beginning of the 20th century, believed there was nothing that could be done to save these animals from extinction, so he might as well get that rug for his study while he could. 
you can see what a challenge to conservation such an attitude would be. And of course, he was one of thousands of men and women hunting bears at the beginning of the 20th century, many of whom, like these guys, were not taking it quite as seriously as Phillips was. Of course, bears did not become extinct. And a lot of the credit goes to a small group of elite men, one of whom, of course, is Theodore Roosevelt. Before we go any further, though, I want to tell you what I mean by elite. So the group of hunters who pushed hardest for conservation at the opening of the 20th century and who I'm going to be talking about tonight had a tremendous amount in common. They were white, native born, Protestant, not just college educated, but usually Ivy educated from the East Coast north of Washington, D.C., and the vast majority of them, about two thirds, were born within the decade after the Civil War. So a very specific profile and many of them also part of a generational cohort. If that weren't enough, many of them were members of the same club, the Boone and Crockett Club, which you might have heard of. This was founded by Roosevelt and his friend George Bird Grinnell in 1887 too, in Teddy's memorable phrase, promote manly sport with the rifle. Applicants for membership had to have killed three big game animals in a sportsmanlike manner. There were only ever 100 members and they were hand-picked members of the elite. So an elite hunting club in 1887. But by 1900, the club had also become one of the most powerful lobbying groups in the country when it came to conservation. And for this talk to work, I need to convince you of how fundamentally weird this was that a group of hunters pursuing manly sport with the rifle became a major force for conservation is itself a bit strange. Prior to the 1880s, hunters overall hadn't been associated that much with conservation, although there were groups in various cities who were starting to have an impact here and there. What's even weirder, though, is that they were successful. In the late 19th century, there was very little support in the United States for game laws, quite the opposite, in fact. So before we can talk about what Roosevelt and the other members of the Hunter Elite accomplished, first we need to understand what they were up against and why their victory was so profoundly counterintuitive. So to begin at the beginning, it's difficult to understate the antipathy most ordinary Americans seem to have had to the idea of game laws. This goes back to the fact that most of our early colonists were from England, and in England, ordinary people couldn't hunt because most of the land and the game on it belonged either to the nobles um, or the king. I didn't actually check this before the talk, but I'm fairly sure that mute swans in public waters in England to this day belong to the queen. So it gives you some idea. If you ever saw the old Errol Flynn Robin Hood, the best Robin Hood, you probably remember that poaching the king's deer in Sherwood Forest is punishable by death. That was in fact the case. And it varied from era to era, but in the late 1700s, a whole series of what were called black laws because the poachers smudged their faces with coal or some other um, darkener um, was passed, making um, poaching punishable by execution. Um, and this was something that the colonists absolutely did not want to import from England, this kind of private ownership of the game. So this is attested to repeatedly by people of different classes in different time periods. Not just that we don't want to be like England in this, but that Americans are never going to stand for it. In 1859, wealthy Carolina planter William Elliott blamed opposition to game laws on the fact that the preservation of game is associated with ideas of aristocracy and oppression toward the poor. A decade later, a middle-class minister from New York named W.H. Murray wrote, I'm not in favor of game laws, pass for the most part in the interest of the poor, of the few and the rich, to the deprivation of the poor and the many. And this appears to have been a very common sentiment. One Englishman who emigrated to Kansas in 1872 said that Americans passed jokes and condemnation on the game laws of England and often railed me on the subject, saying that no country had the right to impose such restrictions on its inhabitants. And it's easy to see the objection. First off, you have a lot of people who are hunting for subsistence, from freed slaves in the American South to Native Americans throughout the West, Southwest, and Alaska, the Alaskan Territory, to enormous numbers of poor whites. You also have lots of members of what were called the middling classes, clerks and pharmacists and shopkeepers, who considered one of the perks of being an American the fact they could just go out and hunt or fish for their dinner if they were in the mood. 
And it's also easy to forget how wild America still was well into the 19th century when George Bird Grinnell was a young man, he could still venture out of his family's house in Manhattan and bag a wild turkey for dinner. The problem, of course, is that as we move toward the end of the 19th century, the combination of rapid population growth and settlement, the um, sort of expansion of industry, especially logging and mining, and commercial hunting in particular, all start making such inroads into game populations that entire species are being wiped out. The bison are gone from the Great Plains. The passenger pigeon is about to become extinct. Roosevelt may have been the last person to ever see one in the wild. And when we look at some of the numbers being posted by hunters, it's not that hard to see why. Some of them are commercial. Plume hunters, for instance, seeking feathers for ladies' hats, had all but wiped out the egret by, eight, not by 1900. But even when we're looking at people just hunting for pleasure, we have stories like one I ran across of six pleasure hunters in Texas who killed 10,000 robins in two hours just for the fun of it. And while most of us wince at those numbers now, I hope all of us, this was very typical. This is how hunting was being pursued for pleasure across most of the US by many hunters, as if there was an endless sea of game that could never be emptied. The problem was that by the 1890s, that sea was beginning to run dry. Now, there were a lot of possible responses to this, but the two solutions that the hunter elite consistently pushed for were the protection of animals in parks and reserves, often so that they could be a reservoir that would ensure future sport hunting, and game legislation at state and federal levels. They wanted protection acts, laws restricting interstate trade in animals and animal parts, limited hunting seasons, bans on certain animals at certain times of the year, bans on certain hunting techniques, and seen from 1880, all of this was going to be a very hard sell. And that wasn't just because a lot of ordinary people were being asked to accept rules and regulations. It's also because of who's pushing these laws. Because Roosevelt and the other club members are unquestionably an American aristocracy. What Owen Wister, best known as author of the Virginian, the first American Western, and a Boone and Crockett member, called the natural aristocracy. They're wealthy, they're college educated, they make a point of tracing their bloodlines. They're exactly the people that Americans should least have trusted when it came to game laws, considering that American opposition to game laws was based in this fear that the wealthy were going to take over all the hunting. And yet Roosevelt and the other club members succeeded and they succeeded quickly. People at the time were startled by how fast public opinion changed on this subject. British hunter, William Bailey Groman, for instance, commented on the widespread support he found for game legislation among Americans in 1900, adding that he did not believe such laws would have been accepted even 20 years earlier. Historians have not gone into this all that deeply. They've acknowledged the important role that hunters played in pushing these regulations, but they haven't really asked how on earth the hunter leak convinced all these people so quickly, what the actual mechanism was. I think that's partly, and this is just a guess, but a lot of academics think it's obvious that you should protect animals and not kill all of them. But from the giant sloth to the dodo to the passenger pigeon, we have lots of evidence that that alone is not enough to get people to stop. And yet Roosevelt and his cohort did it. And they also were the driving force behind the creation of many national parks, which might seem an easier sell until you realize that people had to be dispossessed from that land. Sometimes existing mining and logging operations needed to be shut down. Local communities that depended on those areas suddenly couldn't enter them to forage and fish, also a hard sell. And this is what fascinated me. It's one of the things that originally got me interested in this. How did this group of men in particular ever convince Americans to support these laws? Because they did. It's not just about laws being passed from the top down by the elite. There also seems to have been a groundswell of public support across the country. I also could, should add, the, it's not that the laws were incredibly fair. Many of them did try to be, or at least to be reasonable, but all of them hit the poorest and most vulnerable the hardest, while the elite men pushing these laws paid the least. Roosevelt was completely anomalous among his American peers by 1909 for the massive numbers of animals he killed. But the fact is that when he couldn't hunt that way in the US, he just went on safari to Africa. The restrictions that he was pushing for in the US didn't have to apply to him. He could just afford to go abroad. 
So less wealthy people who were being restricted had no such options. The laws unquestionably were class-based in terms of who took the biggest hit. So if it was class legislation, and if Americans didn't like class legislation, how on earth did the upper class convince them to support it? The answer is that Roosevelt and the other members of the Hunter elite made their case in print over decades using a relatively straightforward two-part argument. First, they argued the game laws, at least the ones they supported, were not about aristocracy, about preserving animals only for the rich, but instead, and this is the second part of the argument, game laws and conservation legislation were for everybody's benefit. Roosevelt noted that while European game laws unquestionably had been administered in the selfish interest of one class, it would be utterly foolish to regard proper game laws as undemocratic, unrepublican. Another club member, Charles Whitehead, rejected the idea that game laws were an unwelcome import from England, arguing that laws for the preservation of wild animals are a product of civilization. The more civilized the nation, the broader and more humane will be these laws, while adding that the great distinction to be ever borne in mind between the game laws of Europe and those of America is that the former were passed for a class, while the laws of a republic are passed for all the people. Those people did not just include all Americans living, however, but also future generations who might want to hunt or fish. Club member Madison Grant declared, what a mission and opportunity the club has in these closing days of the 19th century in its efforts to preserve the game and the forest to future generations. William Hornaday, who was not a club member, but who desperately wanted to be one, um, made a similar argument. The wildlife of today is not wholly ours to dispose of as we please. It has been given to us in trust. Even as club member Casper Whitney declared that national forests are held in trust for us all. Roosevelt again, our duty to the whole, including unborn generations, bids us to restrain an unprincipled present day minority from wasting our heritage. The movement for the conservation of wildlife is essentially democratic in spirit. This language pervaded the writing of the hunter elite. The arguments that game and conservation legislation are for the good of everyone now and in times to come and are also not going to be the same as the game laws from Europe. And as a historian reading all of this, what caught my attention wasn't just that this is such a pervasive argument, but that it is all being made in print. Because another thing that the hunter elite turned out to have in common was that many of them wrote and published about their hunting, usually with an emphasis on the importance of sportsmanship and fair play, and about their conservationist sympathies. You're probably, many of you, familiar with Roosevelt's prolific output, but he was hardly alone. The Boone and Crockett Club did not have a publishing requirement for its members, but even by 1903, one out of four of them had written or published, written and published, a nonfiction article about hunting and or conservation. And the use of writing to push this agenda was very conscious. Whitehead reminded the other members that we must remember in a republic, no law is effective without public opinion to back it. Therefore, contemporaneously with making our laws, we should, by writing and speaking, educate the public mind to appreciate and sustain them. The club published anthologies full of its members' writing, some, much of it not original for the anthologies, but reprinted from other places, so they're appearing two or three times sometimes. And many of these men also found publication in more general thought venues, including some of the most popular and influential magazines of the day, such as Harper's, Scribner's, and Collier's. In this media, they could reach hundreds of thousands of readers across the country. And this is also new. In the long history of hunting by so many varied groups over millennia in North America, this one group of hunters stands out because they so consistently wrote and published. And that wasn't just about their desire to reach a wide audience. It was also about massive changes to the publishing industry in this period, because these magazines, their national reach, and the marketplace that they provided was yet another new thing emerging in the late 19th century, and it was part of what historians call the publishing explosion. And I think this is the missing part of the explanation for why so many people changed their minds so quickly, that it was the medium as well as the message that made the hunter elite such a powerful lobbying group. So it's worth taking a look for a minute at the publishing explosion itself and how it affected Americans. So explosion is a melodramatic term 
but in this case, the melodrama seems justified. Before the explosion, before the Civil War, the US really didn't have a national medium. There are newspapers, but there isn't anything comparable to what's coming at the end of the 19th century. As we can see from the graphs, at the end of the Civil War, there are 700 periodicals in print, roughly. 20 years after that, in 1885, 3,000. But in the next 20 years, from 1885 to 1905, 11,000 periodicals are published. And um, people, more people are reading them as well. Circulation figures also skyrocket. So you have this enormous fluorescence of publishing, which is in constant need of new material, which the Hunter elite is very happy to provide. And you also have a new platform from which to talk to a national audience about game and sportsmanship and conservation and the parks. And this mattered in terms of how many people are being exposed to this language, these ideas, but it also mattered because of how readers seem to have been using magazines in this era. So we've always used media to communicate to one another, to find people who are like us or to let people know we would like to be like them. If it's, you know, whether we're talking about starting to listen to a band in high school because the kids you want to hang out with all seem to like it, or starting to watch a TV series because everyone in your workplace watches it and you're feeling left out of the conversations, what we consume, how we talk about it, and what we think it says about us has always been part of how we identify ourselves, whether it represents the honest truth about ourselves or is what we might call aspirational. And we can see that happening in the publishing explosion. By 1900, a manager of a bank in a small town in Colorado would very likely have subscribed to Harper's and have it out on a table in the parlor for visitors to see, letting them know that he's read it and can discuss the issues of the day. But his clerk might also subscribe to it, reading for the job he wants rather than the job he has. And these two men would also be part of a much wider national community of Harper's readers, separated by distance, but not by sympathy. This could be tremendously empowering. It could, for example, reassure someone with conservationist sympathies who feels surrounded by casual robin hunters that it's his neighbors who have failed to keep up with the changing times that he's actually in step with the rest of the nation. He's the one who's not alone. And these were all ways that the magazine seemed to have been being used. And they were the first thing like this. They were new. What historian Richard Oman calls the first fully developed national culture industry. The reason I'm spending so much time on this is that it matters, especially the aspirational part, because when people like Teddy Roosevelt suggested that game laws properly written were democratic or implied that the opponents of such legislation were foolish or unprincipled, he isn't really talking from the top down, preaching at or scolding readers as much as he's inviting them to identify their own stance as wise, as principled, as democratic, as like his, you too can be like Theodore Roosevelt or Madison Grant or another member of the natural aristocracy. You can identify yourself with them, with their political views, with their social status, with their Americanism, and you can do it by supporting game legislation. Now, this may seem like a lot of weight to put on a few thousand narratives over a couple of decades, and it would be except for one final fact. Along with the popular general magazines, there was also a popular and massively expanding recreational media in this period, and the Hunter elite owned a meaningful piece of it. In 1880, at the age of 31, George Bird Grinnell purchased and became editor of Forest and Stream, the most popular weekly sporting magazine of its day. Just as importantly, in 1900, fervent social climber and club member Casper Whitney became part owner and editor of the influential Outing Magazine, a more lavish monthly publication with a paid subscription of 125,000 readers, and that's before we count newsstand sales. Both men also added presses to their portfolios, Grinnell, Forest, and Stream Press, which published the Boone and Crockett anthologies along with many other books, and Whitney, the Outing Publishing Company. The third magazine I'll be talking about tonight here is a bit different, Recreation, which was owned and edited by George Oliver Shields. Shields is a real outlier here. He, like Grinnell, was born before the Civil War, so he's a bit older than many of, of the folks we'll be talking about, and he did not move in the same social circles as the Hunter elite. Nevertheless, however, he was a passionate conservationist and more than willing to embrace the language that was being used and to throw his support to the cause. 
These magazines appeal to different audiences. You can probably tell just looking at the covers, Outing was explicitly aimed at the more well-to-do middle class. The other two were a bit more lowbrow, but all three had editorial columns. And so these three men taken together formed a nexus in New York publishing that offered a welcoming home to articles about conservation or stories about hunting that emphasized sportsmanship and self-restraint at the same time that all three editors could use their columns as pulpits to sell their personal political support for conservation to their mass reading audience. Grinnell and Whitney were the most persistent about this and their arguments should already sound a bit familiar. Grinnell repeatedly used forest and stream to push the idea that game laws are for everyone. In 1881, he explained that the rich man can travel to distant fields where game is plenty. With the poor man, it is not so. It is therefore the man of modest means who is or should be interested in game preservation, even more than he whose fortune is ample. In a later editorial entitled We the People, he stressed that Laws prohibiting the destruction of game in its breeding season are not for the advantage of any narrow clique. They are the, for the good of us, the people. Whitney sounded much the same theme in outing, telling readers in one column that a man of some education can hardly fail of being wholly in sympathy with game protection, in another explaining that game legislation is a common and vital interest. The protection of wild bird and animal and fish life matters to us, irrespective of class or trade or residence. He reminded men that they might be judged by their sportsmanship and obedience to game limits in the field, adding that every woman can do her share by refusing to purchase a feather trimmed hat. Be a sportsman, he urged his readers. Be a good American. There's a lot going on there, a lot of very loose links and associations being made. But underlying it all is this argument that conservation is not class legislation, but is for the good of the many, for we, the people. This also connected conservation to the wider reform politics of the progressive era, which also often drew on this imagery of the good of the many against the narrow clique, the selfish few, the unprincipled minority, whether those few were robber barons or the men running Standard Oil or the trust that Roosevelt famously said, the powers called the powers that prey. We can hear those echoes, for example, when Madison Grant, one of three club members who founded the Redwoods Protection League, called on patriotic Californians for support, reminding them that the trees were caught in a competition between the growing enlightenment of the people and the forces of destruction. That competition could be said to underlie a lot of progressive era reforms. And of course, it's not just Grant who wants to save the Redwoods, it's the people, or at least the enlightened patriotic ones. And who doesn't wanna be in that group? Whitney made the connection even more explicitly, calling conservationists a handful of patriots working unselfishly for the multitude, cursed by the corrupt, misunderstood by the unintelligent, as is usual in reform movements. I think that it's also partly the looseness of all these associations that helped to make them so powerful. From the beginning, the hunter elite presented themselves as representing this enormous constituency, right? All the people plus unborn generations to come. They never claim to be speaking only for themselves, but identify themselves casually with readers, we the people, and then drew on that to claim that they were selflessly representing the multitude. After all, it can't be class legislation if you're doing it for everybody. To pause for a second and sum up where we've gotten to. We've got the actual articles published by the Hunter Elite and the arguments they made in them. We've also got the owner editors of the national recreational media welcoming these articles and also promoting conservation through their editorial columns. This was powerful and it was also a platform with which no other single group of hunters could possibly compete. Whether we're talking about native Alaskans or commercial plume hunters, the people who stood to lose the most from game laws never had a comparable media outlet from which to express their views. There was no way they could respond to the arguments that Roosevelt, Grinnell, Whitney, Grant, and others used year after year to persuade the American public to support conservation, which is all well and good. But how can we tell if this was reaching the audience in the way that writers and editors intended? Just because Outing was running these editorials, of course, doesn't mean that people were reading them. Outing also ran mountaineering articles and the serialized version of Jack London's White Fang. It's not enough to show that it was published. We need to be sure it was being read. So now I want to turn to the evidence we have that the Hunter League was actually reaching the public with these arguments. 
And of course, that also centers on publishing and what historians call reader reaction. So one example, Grinnell and the Yellowstone Game Protection Act of 1894, which was meant to ensure that the animals in the park as well as the natural features would be protected. That may seem obvious now, but it was not clear then when they were trying to figure out what a national park should be. The question of whether it was the land that was being preserved or also the animals moving around on it was an open question. It actually wasn't until 1918 that hunting was banned in all the national parks as a matter of policy. And this bill was meant to settle that for Yellowstone. While it was being debated in Congress, Grinnell published a petition supporting the act in Forest and Stream calling on every man who has his country's good at heart to copy the petition, circulate among his friends, and then send it to his congressional representatives with the promise of publication in the magazine of those who signed. This is exactly the mix we've been seeing, the appeal to patriotism, the promise of public identification with the cause, and in this case, as you can see, hundreds, thousands of readers complied. And those are just the ones that notified Forest and Stream that they would participated. Um, the part down the middle is actually the blown up version of the tiny paragraph on top of the signatures. Notice um, Grinnell says, these signatures represent the best people in the communities from which they come. How does he know that? Because they support conservation, of course. Now, the act passed, and it might have passed without all this, but we have even better um, evidence of impact when it comes to a place called Howley in Newfoundland. Howley, as you can see, it's sort of in the middle, is based between two lakes with rivers heading off from them. So it's sort of on a bottleneck between the two. And the caribou migration had to pass through here. Howley, you can see the solid black line is the train line which means that the trees have been cleared off on either side of the line and it's very easy access. By the 1890s, Howley had become a slaughterhouse. $200 would buy you a package trip there, including transport, room and board, and mounting of your finest heads. Taxidermists also armed local men and sent them there to get so trophy heads that would be sold onward to London and New York. Whitney, yeah, Outing was just disgusted by this. Whitney published a letter from elite hunter John Millay describing how one man with a Winchester seated on the railway line killed 28 caribou without even standing up and left all but one on the ground to rot. The horror of Howley, Whitney called it. Millay gave us this wonderful sketch as well, a dream of Howley by one who has never been there. You can see and the dogs are running completely amok. The hunters are as well. There's one who's asleep. There's another one staring down the barrel of his own gun. There's female caribou everywhere. And a silhouette against the skyline is the mighty horned caribou representing the true sport to be had beyond the horizon. Um, it's also worth noting, Malay makes such a point of the fact he didn't just not hunt at Howley. He never even went near it. He did get a trophy head from Newfoundland but he hired guides and packers, went into the bogs and did it the hard way. Whitney asked his readers to inundate the government of Newfoundland with demands to protect the caribou at Howley. And in 1902, the government conceded and it was Madison Grant who was invited to write the legislation. Millay gave the public outcry the credit for the passage of the law. So across the country, we have enough people reading these magazines who are also willing to take the time to sign a petition or to write a letter to a foreign government that they're beginning to have an impact. This is a constituency that's partly created, partly uncovered by the media reach. And the media is also empowering them to turn their beliefs into political action. This didn't just function at the federal and international levels, however, but also at the very local. Our best examples here are from George Oliver Shields' Recreation, because Shields ran a column where readers could write in, and they often did so to try to create change in their own communities. One hunter from Idaho wrote in to ask, if there be any game wardens or deputy sheriffs in Idaho, one should be posted at the deer licks on Sulphur Creek near Bear Valley. When I reached there August, we found the hundreds of deer that were always there before had been killed or run out. It's impossible to know if the writer actually reached Idaho law enforcement with this letter, but it's telling that he seems to have thought this was the best way to try. It gives us an idea of the power of this kind of platform, this kind of publicity, and the ways it seems to have empowered some ordinary people to act on their beliefs, which in turn could result in them restricting their neighbors' abilities to hunt or fish to the degree they wanted to.
This neighbor on neighbor restriction boomeranging out to New York and back again is clearest in Shield's most infamous innovation, where he asked readers to use recreation to shame their neighbors. During this period, it wasn't unusual for hunters or fishermen who had a very good day to ask the local paper to take a picture of them with whatever they'd killed and publish it. It would be local news, something of passing interest. Shields asked his readers if they saw this sort of thing in the local paper to cut out the picture and send it to them, to him, where he would relabel the men involved. Here we have a bunch of Seattle swine. This would not have been the caption in the Seattle paper where this picture originally ran. But Shields has relabeled it in order to shame these men for taking such a large bag of animals, and he's done it by comparing them to the most dreaded possible analogy, the hog or game hog. This shows up in all kinds of different forms in the writing of um, conservationists in this period. Club member T.S. Van Dyke devotes a chapter to the great American trout swine, for example. And there's no doubt that readers who sent these in did intend to shame their neighbors. One reader from Colorado Springs sent in a photo of Herbert Gardner of the city who claims to be a hunter. I should like to have you class him with the rest of your pigs. While two readers from Worcester, Massachusetts wrote a letter tattling on their neighbor, Essie Hansen, who had taken over a thousand pounds of fish in a day. Lay it on thick, they urged Shields. Teach him to see himself as others see him. Shields obliged, as you can see, noting that all young boys and men who look on him will be inspired with a wholesome contempt. So this is fascinating for a number of reasons, not least because obviously there are still people all over the country who are cheerfully slaughtering everything that moves, but it's their neighbors who endorse conservation, who have the support of a nationally distributed magazine and of its vitriolic editor. And it's of course hard to tell if most of these men being shamed were even aware of it, but in some ways it doesn't matter readers all over the country could imagine that they might be. This was a very controversial feature of recreation actually, and the hunter elite in general seems to have found it rather distasteful. But that being said, Whitney over at Outing sometimes stooped to much the same level. In 1902, for instance, he told his readers that someone had written to him, telling him that several members of the prestigious Triton Fish and Game Club of which Roosevelt was an honorary member, had reportedly engaged in snow crusting moose. Snow crusting is a hunting technique where you have deep snow with a hard crust formed on top of it. So a moose or caribou breaks through and flounders until it's exhausted and a hunter on snowshoes can run up on the crust and basically execute the animal point blank. This was a super popular form of hunting in the 19th century. Obviously, market hunters and subsistence hunters both liked it for how fast and easy it was, but it was considered great sport by well-to-do men who went hunting in the winter and was also enjoyed by international visitors. 23 members of the Coldstream Guard from England who were visiting Canada took 93 moose in one day through this, which gives you an idea of how easy it was and also how many moose there used to be. Um, this was one of the hunting techniques that the hunter elite absolutely wanted stamped out. So Whitney writes, if the club members allow those who engaged in this snow crusting to continue members of the club, we shall have to withdraw our respect. The Triton Club cannot rest under this stigma, for stigma it is, and nothing less. This is all from a letter that was written to Whitney tattling, although Whitney doesn't know, he doesn't name the um, author of the letter, and he doesn't name the members of the club. This seems to me to indicate that the Hunter Elite were actually fine with snitching and a bit of public shaming. They just want it handled in a classier manner than Shields was doing over in recreation. Anyway, back to recreation for one more second. I want to talk about one more exchange, one that shows that the language being used by the Hunter Elite was being echoed or at least striking a very sympathetic chord among readers. At one point, a reader from Sheboygan wrote in, saying that as far as he could tell, game laws certainly seemed to be class legislation. In the next issue, Shields published a response to that by a New Yorker signing himself Buckskin George, who explained, your correspondent forgets the real purpose of laws. They are created not for any one class, but for the good of all. It is true, many are able to enjoy more privileges than others. This, however, is not a consequence of game laws nor class legislation. It is merely the outgrowth of conditions that have characterized all civil life. I am not a capitalist, but a poor devil hanging over a desk many long hours a day. <laughs> 
Buckskin George appears to have entirely bought into the argument that game laws are for all of us, even if in his case, it seems to have led to a rather disconsolate fatalism. There's a social theorist named Adam Zaworski who works on class. And one of the things he's pointed out is that often there's a debate about whether something is about class at all long before it becomes a clear struggle between classes. I really think that is what's going on here. And that's why it's worth asking what Roosevelt and Whitney and Grinnell and Whitehead thought they were doing rather than just saying it was class legislation and shrugging over why so many people suddenly supported it. The Hunter lead argued that it was not, it was never class legislation and that they acted for the benefit of all. Roosevelt, most emphatically, wild game not on private property does belong to the people. And the only way in which the people can secure their ownership is by protecting it in the interest of all against the vandal few. He and the others claimed that conservation wasn't about class and promoting that claim through the national press, they won that struggle first. Working class hunters didn't just get oppressed by clear class legislation. First, they lost the battle over whether it would be understood as class legislation at all. And the thing was, and I know I did mention this earlier, but it really was very much class legislation in some places in terms of its effects. So if we look back at Howley for one more minute, um, as I said, that caribou on the horizon is beckoning you to hire packers and guides and go off into the bogs. And those guys would also be local. They would be maybe the same men that taxidermists would have hired to go shoot at Howley. Millay included a picture of two of them in his book, the same one where this sketch occurs, and here they are. John Hanks and Steve Bernard are seen carrying over 120 pounds a piece, and yet how jolly they look with such a weight they will tramp all day. Would they have been even more jolly if they could have made the same money in a couple of hours of easy shooting at Howley? I'm thinking yes. And people were not oblivious to the fact that restrictive legislation was going to hit the poorest hardest. But at the end of the day, the hunter really believed that there were just not enough animals left for all the people who wanted to use them. And they wanted animals and wilderness preserved, often for future sport hunting. And they played a central role in convincing Americans as a whole to support that, not just personally, but politically, and often through concrete practical action. What their hunter elite accomplished with this approach could and has filled a book, but some of the highlights include pushing through federal legislation that limited market hunting in Alaska, designing a plan that protected the elephant seals of Guadalupe Island, and pushing through the Adirondack deer law, which restricted, yeah, eliminated all kinds of hunting techniques um, that the hunter elite considered unfair. Um, they raised public support for the Lacey Act of 1900, which was the first federal law protecting wildlife. They created a national plan for game refuges in coordination with the biological survey, which was a little bit um, helped out by the fact that the head of the biological survey, C. Hart Merriam, was a Boone and Crockett associate member. They allied with the Audubon Club to help write and pass the Weeks-McLean Act, which was landmark legislation protecting migratory birds and laid the basis for the first international treaty protecting wildlife. Again, that was made easier because Grinnell was one of the leaders of the Audubon Society. So, you know, that alliance was a pretty obvious one. At one point, 11 of the 12 members of the Audubon board are also Boone and Crockett members. And they created the National, the New York Zoological Society and the Bronx Zoo from which the bison came that were released back into the wild in 1907, the first animal reintroduction in North America. Those bison were released into the Wichita Mountains Wildlife Reserve, which had only recently been created by President Theodore Roosevelt. And that brings us back to him specifically. And the final thing I wanna talk about, the best known legacy of the hunter elite, the national parks. Many of you, when you think of Roosevelt and conservation, may well think of the parks first. And the Hunter Elite was deeply involved with the creation of some of them, as well as the wider ongoing arguments of what should and should not be allowed in them. Their accomplishments weren't all dependent on the national media. In particular, as president, while Roosevelt always gave an enormous number of speeches supporting his legislation, he was able almost single-handedly to massively increase the number of forest, wildlife, and bird reserves to create national parks at Wind Cave, Crater Lake, and Mesa Verde, and after the passage of the Antiquities Act, to create 18 national monuments, including the one at Grand Canyon. 
But he wasn't alone in being interested in these parks and the rest of the hunter elite needed to court public support for their pet projects and they used the media to do that. Grinnell, for example, seen here with his wife on Grinnell Glacier, was the driving force behind Glacier National Park and made his case unsurprisingly in forest and stream. Charles Sheldon, whom I haven't gotten to talk about, but who was a passionate advocate for conservation, was, gets most of the credit for Denali. In that case, he wrote a wonderful book, The Wilderness of Denali, it's a great read, um, and mobilized the club to help lobby for the park, but he also brought National Geographic on board to help make his case to the public. Horace Albright, who was an early director of the National Park Service, later said that it was really only the forceful work of the Boone and Crockett Club that brought Denali enough recognition to make it a park. The club, Grinnell told his readers, had no choice but to support conservation. No sooner had the club been organized than it became apparent that on all hands, the selfishness of individuals was rapidly doing away with all the natural things of this country. Hidden behind this language and these parks were the many losers, including the Blackfeet dispossessed from what became Glacier, the Havasupai tribe whose reservation was completely separated from their hunting grounds by the truly terrible layout of Grand Canyon National Monument, and thousands of locals suddenly barred from hunting, fishing, and even gathering wood in order to benefit the people, in order to benefit all Americans who might or might not want to visit these places as tourists. Some of these were hard fights. Some of them went unnoticed by most of the public, but overwhelmingly, wherever we see the conservation work of the Hunter League taking place, we see it promoted by the same language in the same kind of media that we've been looking at throughout this talk. So in 1903, Roosevelt was visiting Yellowstone. This is my favorite picture of him. I love the joy that you can see he feels at getting on a horse and getting away from civilization. But this was also the trip where he was asked to give a speech at the dedication of the arch at the northern entrance of the park, what's now known as the Roosevelt Arch. And having sat patiently through this, hopefully you can hear the echoes of the arguments that went into persuading the public of the benefit of these places and these animals in what he said. The scheme for its preservation is notable for its essential democracy. Private game reserves can never be more than poor substitutes from the standpoint of the public for great national playgrounds such as this Yellowstone Park. It can be toured with the sense on the part of every visitor that it is in part his property that it is the property of Uncle Sam, and therefore of all of us. The only way that the people as a whole can secure to themselves and their children the enjoyment in perpetuity of the Yellowstone Park is by assuming ownership in the name of the nation and jealously safeguarding and preserving the scenery, the forest, and the wild creatures. There it is, the argument that the hunter elite made for conservation. One website I looked at used as evidence that this was just a great speech, the fact that it was even reprinted in full in Forest and Stream, but at this point, you're not surprised that Grinnell would reprint this in full for the benefit of his readers. These arguments and the use of the media went hand in hand throughout this period, harnessing the momentum of the publishing explosion to make their case to hundreds of thousands of readers, the Hunter Elite changed the deep-seated public perception of game laws and empowered Americans with conservationist sympathies across the country. Together they, the media they owned and edited, and their readers left us a legacy of beauty, nature, and animal life that still shapes the ways we think and talk about conservation today. My final slide has some trivia. I assume many of you are Roosevelt fans. Whitney, on what must have been a very slow day at outing, interviewed everyone he could get his hands on about what one item of luxury they would bring on, bring on a trip. Roosevelt chose dental floss. Um, I should add, yeah, William Lord Smith, who was a Boone and Crockett member and was not a Lord, his parents just gave him that middle name, chose, said that since packers were cheap to hire, he'd bring a portable bathtub. <laughs> Worst employer ever. <laughs> um, and that is the talk. I'm ending with dental floss. Here we go. Well, thank you, Tara. That was um, fascinating. Yeah. And um, I now have to look more closely at Madison Grant because I, I tend to, you know, think of him in terms of his eugenics and, and yeah. has oh, yeah. never been a fan. Exactly. But I, I was fascinated that he uh, was involved with uh, 
conservation as well, hugely, because he was a lawyer, he wrote so much. He wrote the Adirondack Deer Law. He actually created, he's also involved in like making the Tacoma Parkway. And he, he was, he led the fight in Alaska to stop market hunting. And at the same time, yes, he's, he's a hard person to warm up to. His, um, he, he wrote an article on moose hunting and he spent three weeks around Ottawa looking for a moose. He didn't want to kill a moose that had, and I hope it doesn't offend anyone, I'm just, he said he didn't want to kill a moose with a Jewish nose. He wanted an Aryan moose to hang on his wall. And the thing is, I've read thousands of these narratives. I don't think anyone knew what he was talking about. I've never seen that anywhere. But when you read it and he's out there week after week and it, he gets rained on and sleeted on and eaten by black flies and his guide hates him and you're just like, it's like watching karma unfold. <laughs> <laughs> <Not very much. laughs> oh dear. Wow. Oh. Well, I thought yeah. that was that was interesting and I'm going to have to look a little look bit up. more yeah. into that. Exactly, exactly. Um, so we have a question from Tom. Um, was forest and stream a forerunner of field and stream? Or is there a connection there? No. So, no. Um, yeah, um, forest and stream is one of the earliest ones founded. It's actually found in the 1860s and it goes on in a straight line, I think, you know, well into the 20th century. Field and Stream is founded in the 1880s as a separate magazine, and then it founders, go, changes its name a few times, and then settles down as something called the American Field, which is still in print. And then in the 1890s, another magazine named Field and Stream is founded, and that one continues on into the progressive era. Um, I actually needed the help of a librarian at the Boston Public Library to figure out what was going on with Field and Stream, yeah. so it's great to get a question about it. Yeah, that's a great, <laughs> great question. Yeah. All right. Yeah, the um, um, eleven thousand periodicals. Um, a lot of them collapsed or merged or you know became oh, sure. other ones. Yeah, it's a lot yeah. of mixing. I would imagine. Definitely, that's great. Um, and I, I uh, have to go back to our collection and see some. Of, I, I wouldn't want to look through some of those uh, periodicals and see what we have. Um, it was fascinating the way they um, used the periodicals, and mm -hmm. you know, I never. I'd never noticed the the list of all the those people signing the petition before. What a you know mm -hmm. kind of ingenious way to demonstrate support. Great. Um, if anyone else from our online audience has any questions, feel free again to either type them in the chat or our Q and A. Um, Pat, did you have any questions? Well, I was just saying, just as a correlation, uh, Tara, would you say that uh, the, this magazine, the periodical era, in making its case, was sort of like the social media of the day? Very much. Yeah, it does Great. have that. It does have that feeling, and and you see so many um, parallels with it, especially you know we talk about social media as giving, you know, people who are alone um, in small towns, and as a teacher, obviously, you know, I especially think about you know trans people or LGBTQ people who feel very isolated. That the internet has made a huge difference by letting them find their community which is also true, of course, of all kinds of different people. And it feels like the magazines really did this in a lot of communities for conservation. Um, really, even people who felt like they were, you know, that, you know, their neighbor is a, is a game hog, really read recreation, and they know that they're in the right with this. And I think it creates a confidence, um, a willingness to speak up and reach out. Mm -hmm. Great, great. And Shields also, I, one of the things I liked about his column, he also had people just write in with, I mean, really random questions. Like, I can't get my zucchini to grow. Does anyone have any suggestions? And like, no, <laughs> no the next week people would write in and answer it. <laughs> like, I mean, it, it didn't just include record. It was a lot of strange stuff. So it was a little bit like Quora in that sense. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> An early form of Reddit. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yep. There you go. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Great. So we have a question from uh, Pat Duggan. Um, how did TR make the case for conservation when he was a hunter? How was that not questioned by people when he had so many photos of himself with dead animals? So one of the things that sort of 
he, he's a conservationist. The hunters are conservationists in the sense that they want to preserve these animals for a purpose. And one of those purposes is to be hunted. Um, they are not touchy-feely preservationists like John Muir is, or even like Charles Sheldon is. Sheldon is very much someone who thinks that animals have a value in themselves. But if you go more deeply into the hunting narratives, manly sport is a real thing to Roosevelt. He thinks that you know, hunting builds character, it builds willpower. Um, and this was a common, I, common thought. Um, the Federated Women's Clubs of America, the head of it said in Better Homes and Gardens to remember that, you know, any kind of encounter with nature makes your boys manly and your girls gentle. This sort of idea that you build character and self-reliance by going out there. And of course, for Roosevelt, very much had this idea that it was also going to connect you to the frontier, that white native born Protestant men in particular are losing touch with the days of Boone and Crockett, of Kit Carson, of our early um, folks, and that losing that, having the US become this more immigrant urban society was not something he was hugely comfortable with. So he wanted people to have that experience. And it's very much underlying all this. Arnold Haig, who's a club member, argues for Yellowstone because it's gonna be a reservoir for elk to spill out and provide manly, healthy hunting for boys in the generations to come. And this is very much part of the language. It's one of the reasons that the hunter elite supports eliminating wolves from Yellowstone and you know they predate on elk. The point is to breed elk. It's not to preserve a wilderness the way we think of it. So Roosevelt very much thinks that the animals are there to be killed and that that is a reason to save them. Um, you want to save enough of them for sustainable hunting, what we would now call sustainable hunting for generations to come. And when he gets to Africa in particular, um, which is maybe what our questioner is thinking of, he's very out of step at that point with his American peers. Hunting like that, honestly, even 20 years earlier wouldn't have raised an eyebrow. But, you know, in private, some of the hunter elite are expressing some discomfort with what seems an egregious display. Um, that he kills more animals than he needs to, and that this doesn't look great at home for the people that they're asking to accept the game laws. But I honestly think that it has to do slightly with entitlement. It had been a long time since anyone had said no to Roosevelt at, by 1909. And I think that he saw his last chance to really let go and hunt the way he wanted to. The animals were there in the game reserve for this purpose to him. And mm -hmm. You know, you're, you know, he was born into privilege. You're seeing a level of entitlement there where he really, he did, they don't mind hunting. They think hunting is a good thing. And, and when Grinnell says, we can't discourage hunting because the sportsman is the greatest force for conservation. He's right in this point. Mm -hmm. um, the reason, honestly, the reason that we have, you know, bison now is because of these guys. Um, and right. grizzly and antelope and a lot of animals. So it's it's interesting. And of course, it's still true. Groups like Duck Un Ducks Unlimited are mm -hmm. powerful forces for conservation, even though they're also hunters or yes. because they're also hunters. Right, yes. And of course, um, if I'm not mistaken, I mean, TR's trip to um, Africa also kind of had, he almost had, bought himself some cover with the mission through the natural, what it was the Natural History Museum, right? Yeah. So it, it, he could kind of also point at the, the scientific angle. Mm -hmm. um, he certainly tried to, but I'm not sure how many people fell okay. for it um, okay. <laughs> at that point, especially because as a natural amateur natural historian, you know, there's, there are people in the club like Charles Sheldon um, and Andrew Stone who are actually really good at it. So I'm not sure how much people bought it. There's a wonderful, I don't know if you've ever read The Tent Dwellers, Albert Bigelow Payne, who's a satirist, he's a friend of Mark Twain's, publishes this series in Outing that's a send up of camping. If uh, Honestly, if you've ever been camping, it's a wonderful book. It's still in print. But yes, his he has that friend who takes you out. You know, the guy who just, yeah, oh, sure. Canoeing's for everyone. Don't worry. He has a commission from a museum to bag. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so mm -hmm. there's definitely that kind of send up yeah. sort of thing that you know, everyone seems to have this kind of idea, but that is in play. Members of the British Museum, um, 
actually go down to the premier taxidermist, Rowland Wards in London, and they look there for new species on a pretty regular basis. So mm -hmm. sometimes it's kind of legitimate. Yeah, mm -hmm. there's so many complex kind of interrelations between all of these 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 factors, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Great. All right. Um, any more questions from our online audience? Feel free to drop them in the Q&A or the chat. I'm going to hope this means that I was thorough. <laughs> yeah, it was great. Yeah. No, I th I, uh, I loved the graphic about the the uh, pu publishing explosion that yeah. really brought it um, yeah. to to you know visualize that really mm -hmm. well. Um, yeah, it's phenomenal how and of course um, it happens with books as well. And the um, the term bestseller becomes a trade term in 1895. Oh wow! Yeah, okay. that's cool. that's when it becomes part of advertising. Wow, very yeah. neat. Awesome. One thing, one thing I was thinking about, you know, I, the publishing explosion, uh, kind of circling back to that, was so huge. Mm -hmm. But I was also thinking about, you know, at that time, there still was a huge portion of the population that would have been illiterate and would have been missed by this publishing explosion. Was there any um spillover do you think to to that group or was it a group that the these hunter elite were not worried about reaching with their messaging they i don't think they would have been that worried um i've sometimes seen people who focused on you know like racism or nativism nativism is much more of an issue with some of these guys especially hornaday and whitney um but the fact is that their main resistance is always going to come from white middle class or well-to-do right. hunters. The yeah. Adirondack, the Adirondack deer law is it's an incredibly hard fight because they're going up against, they're trying to get rid of um, coursing deer with hounds and um, poach, jack lighting them at night, shining a light on them that blinds them so you can shoot them, which means they're going to be putting guides out of business. They're going to be putting lodges that rent that equipment are you know going to have to shift what they do you've got a lot of hunters who go hunting like that for pleasure so you have small businesses who have the ear of the legislature to some degree and you've got these pleasure hunters who have some political pull and mm -hmm. it's much more of a fight as sad as it is the Havasupai tribe at Grand Canyon there's nothing they can do it's just imposed straight on top of them and the hunter league didn't waste that much time right. going yeah. after them um, Surely there must be another way to phrase that, but yeah, they always was, aim at yeah. men of their own. Yeah, that was my suspicion, but it it does occur to me, you know, in in kind of the current climate where we're we're looking for how other groups were were impacted, impacted. Or, or not. Right. Um, so anyway, all right, um, right. Tara, thank you thank so you. much. This was You're wonderful. Mm -hmm. I am just gonna um, share my screen for half a second. Um, and let's click this out. All right. Uh, are you seeing my screen, Tara? I'm, um, I'm seeing a black screen that says TR site has started screen sharing. Ah, well, gee, gosh. Yeah. Um, yes, it says I'm looking at your screen, but there's nothing on it. Oh, okay. okay. Well, gosh, I guess we'll stop that. Oh, there we go. <laughs> I think you had it though. Let's you, see. Hey guys. Yeah, let's one. see. Do, 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 do. Is, is it there? We we went big and across for a minute and now we're small and vertical again. <laughs> all right. Well, all right. Well, we're gonna we go. skip that. Um, <laughs> all right. I just I but I do want to mention to our audience that. Our next speaker night will be uh, again fourth Tuesday, May twenty fourth, and our speaker is going to be Lisa Partial, who is a uh, professor of political science from Damon University, uh, right here in Western New York. It is going to be a uh, hybrid event, so there'll be an in person audience as well as an online audience. And her topic is, quote, the administrative presidency from TR to Trump, 
the evolution of federal power. Um, I think it's going to be a really interesting talk. I'm going to drop the link in the chat if anyone wants to register. We hope to see everyone there either in person or online. Thank you everyone for joining us. Yes, um, thank you. you. And especially Tara, thank you for such thank an you, interesting talk. You're welcome. Um, thank you for inviting me. This oh, great. this is great. I'm glad I, it took us a while to connect and, and work things out, but I'm really glad that that, that we got it together. So yeah. oh god, COVID land. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean Wonderful. it was it was it was Wonderful. you and me, it was both of us. But anyway, <laughs> thank thanks you. again. Thank you, everyone. Thank you to our online thank audience. You. Have a great night. Have a good night.